Good afternoon. I would like to go ahead and take this time to review some of the items that you should expect to see on the multiple choice portion of your Unit 1 essay. Please make sure that you've read Chapter 17 through 21 because some of the questions may be a little bit more specific. We're going to go ahead and start with chapter 17 with Cornelius Vanderbilt. Cornelius Vanderbilt would gain his initial success in the shipping industry as a young man. He began to build his shipping company and by the eve of the Civil War, he would be referred to as the Commodore. Surprisingly, at the eve of the Civil War, he decided to sell his shipping in company and in turn invest his capital into the railroad industry. You see, Vanderbilt could see around corners that others simply could not. Vanderbilt understood that it was not going to be the transportation of goods by water that was going to revolutionize the country, but it was going to be the transportation of goods by land that was going to bring the United States into the 20th century. As in many cases, Vanderbilt's success would rely upon the success of other industrial types, such as John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. Although these industrial titans were cutthroat businessmen at the end of the day, they also were codependent upon each other. Vanderbilt is also credited with the concept of industrial consolidation, which on a larger scale uh, could resemble a company either horizontally integrating or a large monopoly. Industrial consolidation would simply be the purchasing of smaller companies in order to expand one's own company. Now we'll go ahead and take a look at John D. Rockefeller, his company Standard Oil and Horizontal and Vertical Integration. John D. Rockefeller's initial success would come about due to the mass production of kerosene. Prior to the mass production of kerosene, illumination was considered to be a luxury in most parts of the United States because it was a very inefficient process to manufacture whale oil and other alike luminance. Rockefeller would drill for crude oil, heat the crude oil, and then filter the kerosene and then sell the kerosene to consumers who would then use it for illumination. Rockefeller's later success would come from refining oil. He called his company Standard Oil because he said it represented the standard that all other companies should try to reach. Standard Oil would capitalize on the concepts of vertical integration and horizontal integration. By being vertically integrated, Rockefeller controlled every step of the manufacturing process from drilling the oil to selling the manufactured product to the consumer. By being horizontally integrated, Rockefeller would buy out smaller oil refineries to extend the dominance of standard oil. Please note that it is much easier for a company to become horizontally integrated as opposed to vertically integrated. Rockefeller is also noted for the articulation of the distribution process of manufactured products. By 1890, Rockefeller Standard Oil had a 90% monopoly over refined oil in the United States. By the turn of the century, the federal government began to pass business regulations that aimed to dissolve monopolies that had already existed and put restraints in place to ensure that new monopolies could not be created. As it turns out, Rockefeller made more money with the federal government forcing him to break down Standard Oil than he had with Standard Oil in place. Because as the new companies that were originally part of that 90% monopoly began to flourish, just like Standard Oil had decades before, Rockefeller made sure that he owned at least 51% of the shares within each new company. 
So now we'll go ahead and take a closer look at Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie's success would come from the mass production of steel. Prior to the invention of the Bessemer converter, the production of steel was very costly and very inefficient. By utilizing the Bessemer converter, Andrew Carnegie was able to create the largest steel manufacturing plant in the United States. It would be referred to as the Great Edgar Thompson Steelworks. Prior to 1890, approximately 3,000 tons of steel was produced in the United States per year. After 1890, over 3,000 tons of steel was manufactured in the United States per day. Carnegie devoted quite a bit of time in learning the importance of capitalism, specialization, and innovation. Regarding capitalism, Carnegie argued that manufactured goods are initially seen as luxuries, and as the manufacturing process becomes more efficient, as society adapts to the new technology, manufactured goods that were once considered luxuries become necessities. Carnegie argued in favor of practicing specialization. He used to say, put all of your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. Carnegie argued that if you could be the most successful manufacturer of a single product, then you would be far more successful than if you try to manufacture many different products at the same time. Regarding innovation, Carnegie felt that a manufacturer constantly needed to update and use the most advanced machinery to make a product. The more advanced the machinery, the, me the more efficient the process. If you can increase the efficiency, then you can increase the sale and profit. Historians argue that in 1890, the leading industrial countries was number one, Great Britain, number two, Germany, and number three, the United States. By 1900, with a strong emphasis upon innovation, the United States had bypassed Great Britain and bypassed Germany and have become the industrial leader of the world. Carnegie also understood the importance of keeping a financial buffer between one and their company. By having a financial buffer, Carnegie could expand his company while other companies would be forced to file for bankruptcy or close down during economic crises. Now we'll go ahead and shift to Thomas Alva Edison. Thomas Alva Edison is noted because he claimed an overwhelming number of patents during the Industrial Revolution. Even though many of his patents had been challenged by other industrialists, such as Tesla. Thomas Alva Edison is also credited with the invention of the direct electrical current and the articulation of the incandescent light bulb. We'll go ahead and move forward with George Westinghouse. George Westinghouse is credited with the invention of the alternating electrical current that in combination with electrical transmitters would allow for electricity to be transmitted long distances. Westinghouse is also credited with the invention of the air brake. Prior to the invention of the air brake, it was very dangerous. It was a very dangerous task to slow down or try to stop a train because the sole brake was in the locomotive. Once the individual air brake was invented, an air brake could be placed on each railroad car and each car would simultaneously slow down whenever pressure was put on the brake in the locomotive. As a result, traveling and transporting by railroad would be much safer after the invention of the air brake. Now we'll go ahead and look at the Transcontinental Railroad. The construction of the Transcontinental Railroad is significant for many different reasons. The Transcontinental Railroad, along with a series of spurs, 
would allow for industrialists to identify and extract natural resources anywhere within the country, deliver those natural resources to factories anywhere within the country, and then deliver a manufactured good to any American, regardless if they lived in the Northwest or if they lived in the Southeast. The Transcontinental Railroad would literally connect each corner of the country with the other. Although Reconstruction would theoretically reunite the North and the South after the Civil War, it would be the Transcontinental Railroad that would reunite the East and the West. Now we'll go ahead and move to Sears, Roebuck and Company. The Sears, Roebuck and Company was the first company that pioneered the ordering and shipping of goods by mail. The company would mail possible consumers magazines that would cover every imaginable item and consumers would mail their order form along with their payment to the company and within a short amount of time the consumer would have a delivered good at their doorstep. If you will, Sears, Roebuck and Company was essentially your first Amazon Prime uh, without the two day shipping, of course. Now we'll go ahead and shift to chapter number 18. The New South Gospel encompasses all of the following. One, the New South Gospel would include the South attempting to become more modern with the emphasis placed upon industrialization. Please note that an area cannot be solely agrarian or solely industrial because both an agrarian and industrial economy is codependent upon the other. Two, the former Confederate states pushed for Jim Crow legislation that established segregated societies. Three, the former Confederate states, through Jim Crow legislation, denied people their right of suffrage or right of vote by creating disenfranchisement tools like the literacy test, grandfather clause, poll tax, or the understanding clause. Now we will push to the U.S. Supreme Court case of Plessy versus Ferguson. In the latter part of the 19th century, a man by the name of Homer Plessy decided to challenge the segregation laws of a railroad company within the state of Louisiana. The case made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that that railroad company could segregate its services to the public. You may be familiar with the phrase separate but equal. Please note that the services may have been separate, but they were not equal. After the U.S. Supreme Court case, public libraries, amusement parks, diners, and restaurants began to segregate their services among the public. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court would rule that public schools had to integrate by arguing that the act of segregating public schools was inherently unequal. After the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Brown versus the Board of Education, other public facilities such as libraries, amusement parks, restaurants, and diners would integrate their services as well. Linda B. Johnson would sign the Civil Rights Act of 1964 into law, which made it illegal for any public company to discriminate upon race or upon gender. Now we're going to go ahead and talk about Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington dedicated his entire life to the advancement of African Americans by focusing primarily on economic equality. In 1881, he played a very important role in the foundation of the Tuskegee Institute in the state of Alabama. Although Washington privately fought to tear down the barriers of discrimination and segregation, he was criticized by W.E.B. Du Bois because Du Bois felt that Washington was not publicly challenging discrimination 
and segregation in Southern society. Washington would publish his autobiography entitled Up From Slavery in 1901. Now we'll go ahead and discuss W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois dedicated his entire life to the advancement of African Americans by focusing on political and social equality. In 1909, he played a very important role in the foundation of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Throughout the 20th century and the 21st century, the NAACP has played a significant role in identifying cases such as Brown versus the Board of Education and pushing for US Supreme Court rulings in favor of integration and equality. Du Bois was the first African-American man to earn his doctoral degree from Harvard University, and he was a sociologist of segregation. Now we'll go ahead and take a look at the Battle of Little Bighorn. The Battle of Little Bighorn is significant because during this battle, the Native American tribes on the Great Plains came together as an alliance and defeated the U.S. Army. Unfortunately, after the Battle of Little Bighorn, the Native American Alliance broke back down. And by 1880, the majority of Native Americans that have once lived across the Great Plains had died or had been forced to move into Native American territories. This marks one of the most heartbreaking chapters in American history. The Dahl Severity Act. By the end of the 19th century, the U.S. government began to oppress Native Americans by creating initiatives that would force them to assimilate economically. Through the Dahl Severity Act, the U.S. government aimed to give land to Native Americans for the use of cultivation. Through the cultivation of crops, the U.S. government meant to assimilate Native Americans into the agrarian economy. The land that the U.S. government gave to Native Americans was essentially useless when it came to cultivation. Now we'll discuss Helen Hunt Jackson's publication of A Century of Dishonor. Helen Hunt Jackson, through her publication of A Century of Dishonor, would force Americans to come to terms and take ownership of the decisions and actions that the federal government and the state government took and the discrimination uh, and atrocities that the US government was behind against the Native American tribes along the Great Plains. Then we'll go ahead and briefly talk about the Chinese Exclusion Act. The Chinese Exclusion Act was the first law that discriminated against a specific ethnic or national group. The Chinese Exclusion Act would block Chinese citizens from coming into the United States. The Sherman Antitrust Act. The Sherman Antitrust Act is an example of a law that is passed by the federal government uh, to either break down monopolies that already existed or put restraints in place to ensure that new monopolies would not be created. Sherman Antitrust Act is on your review, but you may also be familiar with the Clayton Antitrust Act as well. Now we'll go ahead and look briefly at Theodore, the Theodore Roosevelt administration. 
During the Theodore Roosevelt administration, there was quite a bit of emphasis placed upon environmentalism in the form of preservation and or conservation. The Theodore Roosevelt administration would also focus upon progressive legislation. For example, in 1906, President Roosevelt would sign the Pure Food and Drug Act, and he would also sign the Meat Inspection Act into law that same year. With the Spanish-American War, uh, make sure that you note that the United States emerged from the Spanish-American War as an imperial power of the world. Please be familiar with the land that the United States claimed coming out of that global conflict. Yellow journalism. Yellow journalism is defined as sensational, exaggerated, and for the most part, fictional news that is intended to be received by an emotional or political response. Please note that yellow journalism has also been referred to as propaganda, fake news, or alternative facts. That brings us to chapter 21. Chapter 21 primarily looks at the progressive era, and we'll begin with governmental reform on federal, state, and municipal levels. One of the primary focuses during the progressive era was governmental reform. Please be familiar with governmental reform on the federal, state, and municipal level. An example of federal reform would be the ratification of the 16th Amendment that would implement a federal income tax. So April 14th of every year, every American pays a income tax or has to submit their uh, income tax documentation. Uh, that was, so that was established with the ratification of the 16th Amendment. An example of municipal reform would be the implementation of civil service exams. Prior to the implementation of civil service exams, some political officials were elected and served many terms by the use of corruption or bribes. Civil service exams would require people who ran for political offices to prove their knowledge, their skills, talk about their past performances, and talk about their vision for their city or their vision for their county or state or federal government uh, prior to be elected to that position. So ensuring that you are putting people in certain offices because of their ability to do that job, not for their ability to uh, be corrupt and not for their ability to bribe others for a vote. The 17th Amendment, the ratification of the 17th Amendment represents governmental reform on both the federal and state levels. 17th Amendment would call for a direct election for federal senators. So as you recall, we recently had a Senate race here in the state of Texas uh, between Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke. The National Child Labor Committee. The National Child Labor Committee would push for federal and state legislation that would make it illegal for companies to employ children for the manufacturing of products. Prior to the progressive movement, companies like Carnegie Steel exploited and endangered children by forcing them to work in mills and factories. The National Child Labor Committee aimed to provide for the health, the safety, and the education of children across the country. The Forest Reserve Act of 1891. The Forest Reserve Act of 1891 
aim to tackle the environmental threat of deforestation by preserving the natural forests throughout the country. Upton Sinclair's publication of The Jungle. The publication of The Jungle would inspire President Theodore Roosevelt to push for legislation that would provide for the health of the American consumer. Uh, Roosevelt would sign the Food and Drug Act into law in 1906. He would also sign the Meat Inspection Act into law in 1906. It is said that after reading Sinclair's The Jungle, uh, he never could eat sausage again. Uh, so prior to reading the novel, it was noted that one of Roosevelt's favorite breakfast foods was sausage. And after he read that novel, uh, he simply could not uh, ever eat sausage again. Ida Tarbell. Ida Tarbell is noted for her investigative journalism into the Standard Oil Company. She exposed the corruption and unethical practices within the Standard Oil Company. No doubt her efforts along with other investigators would eventually force the federal government to break down Standard Oil's 90% monopoly. The 19th Amendment. The first wave of the feminist movement began prior to the Civil War with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Lucretia Mott. And it would bring about, it would eventually bring about the ratification of the 19th Amendment uh, due to the dedication of Ida B. Wells and Alice Paul. The 19th Amendment, which was ratified in 1920, would secure the right to vote for women in all federal, state, and local political elections. Remember the right of suffrage is the key when it comes to a democracy. Having the right to vote equates to having the right to implement change. Now we'll take a look at the temperance movement. Leaders of the temperance movement push society to remove the production, sale, and consumption of alcohol. The momentum of the temperance movement would soon bring about the ratification of the 18th Amendment, that's also referred to as the Prohibition Amendment, which would make it illegal uh, for people to uh, consume, sell, or produce alcohol within the United States. Although the Prohibition Amendment would be repealed during the Great Depression, it would leave behind the rise of organized crime in its wake. The last item on the review is the Settlement House Movement. Jane Addams pioneered the Settlement House Movement in the United States by establishing the whole house in the heart of Chicago. In fact, if you travel to Chicago today, uh, you can uh, go to the whole house. Uh, settlement houses uh, normally uh, were promoted uh, by middle-class Protestants and they aim to provide various social services uh, to the population of urban areas. The settlement house movement essentially began in Europe and later uh, it was brought to the United States by pioneers like Jane Addams. So I hope this review helps you uh, re-familiarize yourself with the items that you're going to see on the multiple choice portion of the unit one exam. Um, you know, make sure that you go back through and uh, you have a clear understanding of 
Andrew Carnegie's The Gospel of Wealth because that is your unit one essay. Again, you can find the instructions, the writing prompt, and the grading rubric for that unit one essay on your unit one review. Uh, simply click on the unit reviews tab under the course menu and click unit one review. It'll be the last two pages. And also, uh, please remember that uh, Carnegie's Gospel of Wealth is one of the resources that I provided. And you can actually pull up the article or you can listen to it as an audiobook. I wish you the best of luck on the exam and I hope you have a good day. Thank you for your time.